So yeah, my name is Stratis, and this morning I'm going to be talking you, to you about conversational interfaces. So a little bit about me before I begin. Um, as um, you know, I'm a senior user experience designer at Aviva's Digital Garage. And for those of you who don't know what Aviva is, it's probably the coolest insurance company you can find. <laughs> and <laughs> through our campuses um, all over the world, including the UK, France, uh, Canada, and Singapore, we're trying to help our millions of customers make better financial decisions through customer-centered design and through new technology. And one of the ways we've been experimenting with to help our customers manage or solve their problems is conversational interfaces. And I'm sure you've heard about conversational interfaces, but I'm also sure that you heard about a, um, a lot of other jargon that is often used in, in, interchangeably. So before I start talking about projects that are using those interfaces, I think it's, uh, it will be worth clarifying the lingo. So a conversational interface is an interface that emulates human-to-human uh, -human interaction. The abbreviation is CUI, and the, main, the difference between more traditional graphical user interfaces, in which you navigate through visual metaphors like folders, files, you click on buttons, is that in a conversational interface, you just tell the, the service what you would like it to do through language, and then it does it for you. So there are two main types. The, the first one is voice-first assistants, like uh, Google Home and Amazon Alexa, and text-first assistants, where you can find on websites or on platforms like Facebook Messenger and Slack. And one other thing that I need to clarify is that AI is advanced algorithms that can greatly enhance a service that uses a conversational interface, but uh, on the same time, it's not synonymous with it. It can also power traditional web pages. A good example of this is My Aviva, a platform that we have at Aviva that allows our customers to have all their policies into one place that learns about their preferences and unique situations and provides them with personalized offers. So AI is not necessary for a service that uses a conversational interface. So now we clarified that, uh, let's talk about what we do at Aviva. So at Aviva we're experimenting with both services that uses voice and text-based conversational interfaces. We have our customer support bot powered by Nuance that helps our customers get help and answers to questions that they might have, like when they want to make a claim or they want to make a change to their policy, but allow them to type, express their intention through a natural language. We also have a skill for Amazon Alexa which allows customers to get explanations to confusing insurance terms by just asking through their voice. And for one of our brands, CodeMeHappy.com, uh, we have a Facebook Messenger bot that helps them get a home insurance quote in a conversational way. And as you can see, we're, we're experimenting a lot with those interfaces, but it's not only us. The industry has seen a big rise in the past few years. It was projected that in 2017, people would use assist, uh, bots or Siri more than uh, once a month, that almost half US consumers are using voice-enabled bots, and big tech giants are integrating services with conversational interfaces into their core strategies. So that has led to the discussion on whether we eventually going to use language and conversational interfaces for everything. And after working in products that are using them for the past few years, my, um, my thinking on that is that they're not. <laughs> and uh, while they have many experience benefits, they have also very experienced limitations of a graphical interface. So during my talk, I'm going to draw up examples from our work uh, on what we found that works, and what are the benefits of using a conversational approach, what are the limitations, and how we think that they can be improved in the future. So let's start with experience benefits. The first one is that when the end result can be articulated uh, easily, then a service that uses a conversational interface can do, skip and do a lot of the intermediate steps for you and save you time. For example, at a company like Aviva, which has a lot of products and a lot of complex products, if somebody would like to contact us, they would have to go to the contact us page, select um, the car and motor ca category, then find motorcycle insurance, then find claims, and because we have different types of claims, they would have to find the number for new claims. It's worth noting we have more than 15,000 different numbers at Aviva. While uh, if they use our chatbot, they would just articulate their end goal, and the bot will just skip all those steps for them and provide them with the information they need to meet their goals faster. 
So speed is one thing. The other thing is mostly about voice interfaces is convenience. So voice interfaces allow people to um, use services when they have their hands full and they allow them to multitask or when they don't have other devices around. An example is a skill we have for Amazon Alexa, which allows our customers when, say, they're reading an insurance document and they have an unknown jargon to ask Alexa via voice without having to pick up their phone, open their browser, and search for their question. So it can be more convenient in certain points. The last thing is that they feel more personal. And uh, we've seen that, we, we, as I said before, for one of our brands, we have a Facebook Messenger bot that helps customers get a home insurance quote. So we tested that versus the experience of the website. And even though both experience had the same uh, questions, and even though our Messenger bot didn't really have AI, didn't learn about the customer's preferences and needs to create a really personalized experience, people still felt our, our users that most of our users that it felt more personal even though they couldn't articulate why uh, many times so it feels more personal when the end result can be articulated quickly it's faster and voice and in conversational interfaces can provide convenience so now let's talk about experience limitations uh, we have identified two types the first ones are have to do with technology which means that are temporary because technology always evolves and conversation, and there are some conversational limitations, which just they are inherent to the nature of language and words. So, the technological ones are that conversational agents at the moment don't really understand meaning, most of them at least, and they lack a lot of understanding that humans have when they converse. So, when we talk with other people, we have uh, context, we have empathy, we have common sense, we have shared experiences, but at the moment, most bots. Uh, use the most popular AI tool is called natural language understanding which just extracts certain phrases or certain keywords and maps them to decision trees so that means that designers need to cater for all the different nuances of language and map different um, words or phrases to different decision trees which many times leads to disappointment because you cannot really cater for everything and you can uh, lead to examples like a few days ago I was using um, a bot that could diagnose what I had because I wasn't feeling very well. So I logged in through Facebook and they knew some of my information. I said I'm sick and it concluded that I'm asking about <laughs> pregnancy. <laughs> so obviously that likely wouldn't happen when you converse to a human. <laughs> and uh, now we have conversational limitations. Some things uh, in conversations, the affordances and constraints are not very easily discoverable. And also certain types of information cannot be easily conveyed through words. Let's take, for example, this pet insurance we have that uses a graphical user interface. Here, all the constraints are visible up front. You know, you can get a quote, find out more about cover options, and find out how you can get help. And the likelihood of error is very little because the experience is constrained in a way that prevents it. But in a conversational interface, uh, especially when there is free entry input, there is no, really no constraints on how far you can push the conversation and how much you can ask. And very often that can lead to errors because users have high expectations and they will try to ask and push the system as much as they can. And the other thing is that you need to rely on recall because you need to re remember what you're allowed to ask, which usually don't, doesn't lead to a great experience in terms of usability. A great example is our Call Me Happy messenger bot. So even though we try to set the right expectations throughout the omnichannel journey that it's just for home insurance quotes, uh, more than 50% of demands were about getting customer support. And you know, that might partly illustrates that we were trying to solve the wrong problem for our users, but it also illustrates that the experience didn't prevent them and didn't make the affordances clear. Um, <clears throat> And the other thing is that just some type of information is very hard to be conveyed through language and words, both in terms of the user conveying it to the system and from the system conveying it to the user. This is Save My Future, a tool that helps customers uh, visualize their ideal retirement lifestyle. And by answering a few questions, they can, at the end, toggle between different uh, retirement lifestyles depending on how much they would like to spend on things like 
uh, travel, like food, home, and see how does that affect what uh, their time and lifestyle and their income, get immediate feedback on how it affects their cost and income. So that in a conversational experience would be really hard to convey through words. And also even articulating that you want to pick one option over the other, say the third one or pick the one for with 99 pounds for spending on a home retirement lifestyle will require more cognitive effort than a graphical user interface. And that becomes even more prominent in more advanced financial tools like our pension uh, tool which the user can uh, see how their pension can perform in the future by changing their contributions or how their funds are invested, uh, which uses more than a thousand data points to convey very abstract information, which uh, would not be easy to convey through words. So the key takeaway from this is don't try to solve every problem with conversational interfaces. So now that we know that there are uh, both benefits and uh, shortcomings on those types of interfaces, how can we make them better? To, to, to find out how we can, we can make them better, I think it's good to look about how we started interacting with computers. So since the very beginning, we were always fascinating about what computers could do. And as Alan Cooper said, puts it nicely, the biggest problem was that it was hard for us to tell them what we would like them to do. So a lot of people would argue that language is the way to go in words because it's very natural to us, that we've been using it for more than 100,000 years. And because of that, that's why we started with a command line, which is, in a way, it's a form of a conversational interface. And when that didn't get mass adoption because of it, the fact that it required memorized syntax, we've been dreaming about bringing it back for a long time. The counter argument to that is that also graphical interfaces and visual metaphors of direct manipulation, like folders and buttons and windows, are also natural to us because we, we use direct manipulation in our everyday lives as well. And we've been working on those types of interfaces to meet our customer needs and solve problems for many years. We've been improving them. And they're good for certain things, as we've seen. So since we know the conversational experience has the following benefits, they're faster when the end state can be articulated easily. They allow free hands interaction, so it makes them more convenient at some points. And they feel more personal and human. And we know that graphical interfaces are faster for tasks that require exploratory interactions and fiddling and can convey information that can be abstract and that cannot be easily handled through language and have easily discoverable affordances and constraints. So why don't we could combine them to create something better and allows us to solve our customers' problems in more efficient ways. And this has already started happening. We see this app operator, it uses a conversational interface which is personal, it feels personal, but um, it makes the constraints more visible by using a graphical representation. For example, you have only three options, uh, price options to choose from. So the likelihood of error gets minimized and you don't have to rely on recall to remember what you're allowed to ask. And we can learn from other markets as well. WeChat, the most popular chat app in Asia, almost one billion users, uses a conversational interface but very often um, users interact with mini apps within it for tasks that are more appropriate. And that has let Facebook create a thing called WebView, which allows you to create uh, web pages within the conversational chatbot environment, which we use at callmehappy.com for the question of what's your address, because allowing users to select between a list would minimize the likelihood of error. So that can be enhanced even further by using elements from multiple modalities. So at some point, we could lead to an experience like um, this. I'm going to play you a short clip for the Iron Man movie, just to illustrate my point. Shall I store this on the stock industry's central database? I actually don't know who to trust right now. Till further notice, why don't we just keep everything on my private server? Working on a secret project, are we, sir? I don't want this lined up in the wrong hands. So as you can see here, Tony Stark uh, used conversation when it made more sense, when he could articulate the end result, save the files to the server that allow him to multitask. But when he wanted to explore this hologram and see different aspects of it and uh, different sides of it, he used gestures and direct manipulation, which would, be, it would require more cognitive effort to articulate through language. And uh, part of, we partly are doing this at the moment. Uh, with uh, Amazon Fire TV, for example. You can use your voice, because it's easier than typing, to search for certain types of films. And then you can use your remote control 
to quickly scan between graphical elements to see which movie would be uh, interesting to you. And obviously with more advanced stuff uh, coming up soon with Microsoft Cortana and HoloLens. So at the end of the day, this is how we navigate the physical world around us. For example, at a restaurant, you're gonna use your direct manipulation to scan quickly elements on the menu and uh, find out what is uh, the, the thing you would like to choose. And then if you have further questions or you want a more personal connection, you would uh, talk to the waiter in a conversational way, of course. So two key takeaways. Conversational interfaces have various usability limitations and they're not an appropriate tool to solve every problem. To, and then we can minimize those usability limitations by incorporating interactions from graphical user interface and multiple modalities. Thank you.